Hello everyone and welcome to the second video on the SMO Junior 2020. In this video, we will be going through questions 6 through 10. Let's start immediately with question 6, which mentions n as a positive integer, the LCM of 4, 5, and n to be 20, 20. And it asks us to find the sum of the smallest possible n and the largest possible n which are really two different small questions put together. Whenever we see lowest common multiple or a highest common factor being mentioned, it is logical that we focus on the prime factorization of the numbers. So 2020 is factorized as 2 squared times 5 times 101. As so a general rule of thumb, it's good to know the prime factorization of the year you're in before going for any math olympiad around the world. So 2020, thankfully, is not very difficult to factorize. And in fact, we see 4 and 5 are already in the LCM. To find the smallest possible n, we are essentially asking ourselves this. What n can I put in such that it is necessary to have all of these factors in the lowest common multiple. So for example, if I just put n equals to 1, I do not need 101. So my LCM will be just 20. Going on this logic, it should be quite clear that 101 is precisely what we need in order to make 101 a required factor in the lowest common multiple. Conversely, if we are looking for the largest n, we are looking for how far can you go such that 2020 is still going to be a common multiple of 4, 5, and n. In other words, n should be the biggest possible factor of 2020. And what better factor to pick than 2020 itself, which is obviously the largest candidate. Immediately, this tells us that if we add together 101 and 2020, 2121 is the correct answer. In question 7, we have got a statement about a division. A 5-digit number is divided by a 4-digit number, giving a quotient of 4 and a remainder of another 4-digit number. And these numbers have unknown digits x and y. It is probably easier if we rewrite this as a multiplication instead, using the definition of your quotient and remainder. So. 2x6yx, which is the dividend, is equal to the divisor, 5y27, multiplied by the quotient, and plus the leftover remainder x106. We are asked then to find the value of the digit x from here, which can surely be done in quite a few different ways. However, it is probably easiest in this question to look at the units digit. 7, 4, and 6 are all the units digits on the right that matter, and they are actually known, which means that x, which is the units digit of the left-hand side, is also very easy to find. All we need to do is to take 7 times 4 plus 6, which is equal to 34, and that implies that the units digit on the left, which is x, is just equal to 4. I'll leave you to think about how you can find y. And one way would be to just look at the last two digits instead of the last digit of the right-hand side. In question 8, we are asked to find how many multiples of 11 are there in the sequence of consecutive numbers from 1100 to 2020. Pretty obvious that we start from 1100 itself because that is 11 times 100. However, 2020 is not a multiple of 11 and we will need to double check now where does this sequence of multiples of 11 end. 2020 divided by 11 would be equals to 183 remainder 7. I shall save you the calculation time and just get straight to this value because that means that the last term that is a multiple of 11 will be none other than 11 times 183. This turns out to be 2020 minus 7, which is 2013 
But we don't actually need that number because counting it from 11 times 100, 11 times 101, 11 times 102, until 11 times 183 is actually very simple. We just need to take 183 minus 100 plus 1. And that gives us 84 numbers. Now for those of you who have always wondered why do we plus 1 at the end, the idea is that when we subtract the smallest from the largest, we are counting the number of intervals between the smallest and largest number. So for example, if I have the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, which is the interval 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 4. But that is not the correct number of terms. The correct number of terms is one more than that. So that's the reason why we have to add 1 back at the end. Next up, question 9 talks about quadruples of positive integers and says that they are skewed if the median and mode are equal and both of these are greater than the mean. What we are asked to find is how many skewed quadruples are there in non-decreasing order such that their sum is equal to 40. Before we do anything, let's recap what it means for us to have the mean, median and mode of a list of numbers. The mean is just the average. You add everything up and you divide by how many terms there are. In this case, the average is just 40 divided by 4, which is 10. The median is the middle number when you arrange them in order. If they are an even number of numbers, such as in this case, then you are not going to take the middle number you take the average of the two middle numbers. So it's either the middle number if there are an odd number of terms or the average of the two middle numbers if there are an even number of terms. For our case, since A is less than or equals to B is less than or equals to C is less than or equals to D, this median is B plus C over 2. Finally, the mode of any list of numbers is just the one that appears the most often. If they mention the mode, uh, there can be more than one mode. If let's say you have two different numbers that appear equally often, but when you have the mode being mentioned like this, we can assume it is unique. So there cannot be the mode being two different possibilities or in fact four different possibilities. So let's just say that the mode is the one that appears most often. And for example, since b plus c over 2 is the median and the median and mode are the same, it tells us that this mode is also b plus c over 2. Now this leads us to an interesting observation. The mode is the one that appears the most often, but if you think about it, b, c and b plus c over 2, b plus c over 2 is actually kind of stuck in the middle. So just imagine a number line, we have got A, B, C and D, now B plus C over 2 is over here, which is not even one of the four numbers. So how can it appear most often if it's not even one of the four numbers? The way to reconcile this is to realize that this statement of the median and mode being equal tells us that B and C are the same. So if B and C are the same, then the average of the two middle numbers is just both of them, and the mode is also both of them. They appear twice. So that makes our life pretty easy, because even though we are dealing with quadruples, the two middle numbers are the same. And furthermore, the mean is known to be 10, and the sum is 40. So the mean has to be smaller than the median and mode, so your median and mode have to be at least 11. So let's try to look at each case. If the mode is equal to 11, what do we do? Well, we know the two middle numbers are 11, and so these two numbers here sum to 18. If they sum to 18, we just need to make sure that the number at the back 
is the largest, so it has to be at least 11, while the number at the front uh, has to be less than 11. So this first number can be 11, 12, all the way up to the most that we can go to is 17. The reason why 17 would be that the smallest a can be is 1. So if a is 1, b is 11, and c is 11, then we are only left with 17 for d. So this tells us that there are 7 choices from 11 to 17 for d, because a would be fixed based on my choice of d. Let's look again at the next case for the mode being equal to 12. The mode is 12, then the two other numbers this time would sum to 16. The first number again is at least 1, so that means that the number behind is at most 15, but at least 12. So your options range from 12 to 15. And from 12 to 15 is 4 possibilities. Next case is the mode is equal to 13. If we have 13 and 13, means that the first and last numbers sum to 14. It is fairly clear that the only way we can do this is if the first number is 1 and the last number is 13. So there is only one case for the mode being 13, which is 1, 13, 13, 13. By this same argument, the mode cannot be 14 or larger, because if we multiply that by 3, that already exceeds 40. So which means the last three numbers will already go past 40 for any larger mode. And therefore, the number of quadruples is just 7 plus 4 plus 1, which is equal to 12. Finally, let's look at question 10. We have got Tn as a linear sequence and Sn as a quadratic sequence. And we are asked to find S101 minus T101. Now, to make it very clear, when we say that Tn is a linear sequence, it means something like Tn equals to An plus B. And when we say that Sn is a quadratic sequence, it means Sn is something like Cn squared plus Dn plus E. Certainly, this is one possible way to go about it. We can look for the value of Tn, specifically T101, by finding A and B based on the first few terms. And likewise, we can do the same for C, D, and E, and therefore find S of 101. However, there is an alternative approach to deal with this question using the properties of quadratic sequences. Now, first things first, we can come up with a new auxiliary sequence. Um, let's call this new auxiliary sequence D. And D will be the difference between S and T, such as in what we want. That would now be D101. Now Dn is still going to be a quadratic sequence because a quadratic minus a linear expression is still quadratic. So this is still quadratic. The benefit of doing this is we now only need to focus on one sequence instead of two. So my sequence D, S1 minus T1 is 0, S2 minus T2 is 10, S3 minus T3 is 23, and so on. So what we want to find would be D101. The next question to ask would then be, how do I find out what is the 101st term of D? This comes down to the property of quadratic sequences. And really, this extends to a cubic sequence or any other polynomial sequence. When you have a quadratic sequence, if let's say that we write the numbers down, we can use the method of successive differences. Now, the method of successive differences means that if we take the difference of terms, in this case 10 and 13, this is called the first difference. And if the original sequence is quadratic, then the first difference will be linear. 
And if the first difference is linear, and we take the differences again, this is called the second difference. And the second differences are constant. So this is applicable to any quadratic sequence. Um, you could try out the square numbers, for instance, and you would get a similar pattern as well. So if the second differences are constant, that means that you can fill up your first differences and so on. And these first differences in turn give us our terms of D. Now, of course, we don't really want to write down all the way until the 101st difference between S, N, and T, N. So instead, it suffices to add up the first differences to find out what is the 101st term. So let me show you what I mean. In order to find the second term, the 10 is just 10 from here. 23 is just 10 plus 13. And then you plus 16 to get the next term. And so on. So if you want to get the 101st term, it's actually the sum of the first 100 first differences. So we need to find out what is the 100 first difference. And in turn, the 100 first difference is you start with the number 10 and you add 3 99 times. So 10 plus 3 times 99, which is 307. And this would be the last of the first differences that we need to add together. So let's add them all up. 10 plus 13 plus 16 plus 19 until 307. Now this is a linear sequence, also known as an arithmetic progression. So that means that it is pretty easy to sum this up. We just take the first and the last number. That would be the sum of each pair of numbers. We multiply by the number of terms, which we are already aware is 100, and divide by 2, because 100 numbers gives you 50 pairs. Doing this calculation, we are going to get the numerical answer, which is 15,000. 850. So that brings us to the end of this video and in the next video we'll be looking at questions 11 through 15.